we thought for this panel we do something that is close to our hearts here at Playgrounds and it is uh, creative confidence because this is something that we might have missed in the last year. It might be something that you need, it is essential to kind of flourish as an artist. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to talk about how to stay sane in these really insane times that we have been living so far or might be still living in. So for this last panel, we have created this wonderful group of people whom we've known and whom we love. So it really feels like coming home. This is the home stretch for us. Um, so that is coming up now. But don't forget, after the panel, we have a grand finale. We have a extravaganza, if you want, however you want to call it. We have Harry Mack, which is lots of fun. So don't leave us just yet. But now, right now, our very last, final, concluding, epic, last thing that we are doing here tonight. It is how to thrive and not only survive. Welcome back everybody and we're almost there. So this is like the last part of the 24 hour marathon. And first I have to say thank you so much for staying so long with us. I'm really proud about you and I'm really proud about my team. Uh, but before we're going to leave this marathon, uh, I think one of the most important things uh, we need to discuss before we finish this and that's your mental health and that's our mental health and that's also like how things are organized in our industry and education so i think me as a teacher but also as a festival director i have a huge responsibility in this and i would love to discuss it with uh, a few experts in this field and uh, people that uh, really can contribute to this discussion uh, it's an open discussion, uh, um, so feel free also to ask questions. We will try to interpret it, uh, incorporate it, and uh, let's start. Uh, but first, I will introduce them to you. Um, here on my left, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 24 hours, I don't know, right, left, right, left. To my left, the man with the beard, uh, Spiridon. Uh, welcome in our, uh, in our panel on mental health, um, how to thrive and not only to survive. Can you briefly introduce yourself? Um, yeah, my name is uh, Spiridon. I'm a publisher and um, I like to work with the creative community and um, mental health is quite a big topic for myself. So I'm really thrilled to be here. All right. And in the middle, we have Stephanie Ayo. Uh, can you also please introduce yourself? Absolutely. So my name is Stephanie and I work at ArtStation. I know some of you don't really see the people behind the scenes of the platforms, but here I am. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I usually take care of business development. And what I love about what I do is I get to work with artists and studios and, and like companies and try to get them and bring them together and uh, find a way for ArtStation to support them. So that's what I do. All right. And on the right corner, we have Michelle White. Can you also please introduce yourself to our audience? I can. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Michelle White. I'm really, really happy to be here. My background is in the film and TV industry, um, but I'm now an applied positive psychologist and a coaching psychologist. And I kind of work at the intersection between um, psychology and creativity, basically. So working with lots of young um, filmmakers and writers and, and, and artists um, and really about kind of developing people's inner strength and their inner resources. And um, I talk a lot about things like sustainable resilience. How can you really thrive and have a long career in a very, very high performance creative industry? Yes, because that's under pressure, we can say. Right, Michelle? So there is like, it's a, what you already mentioned, it's a high demanding industry. Uh, what do you think is the biggest threat at this moment for people that will start in this industry? I think a really big threat is the, the level of pressure. And I think burnout is a very, very big threat for people who are working in this industry. And this is certainly something, the topic of burnout, that I work around an awful lot. Um, people start out in the industry and they want to move very, very quickly. Um, which is really, really understandable. Um, and they want things to happen very, very quickly. But it, it adds 
an emotional internal pressure um, on top of what is already a very, very pressurized environment. And this is exactly the kind of maelstrom of things, you know, the external pressures plus the internal emotional pressures, which which can really kind of cause people to burn out and to sometimes, you know, even leave the industry. Yeah, it's it's a discussion that it's like now already sometimes discussed for for a year or so. Spiridon, you had like a few panels on it. Do you see it still growing? The uh, the problem that uh, Michel just uh, told us. I think the pandemic hasn't made it easier because there are so many um, there's so many people now since since everybody's locked up have started to think like okay now I am home. Now I really have to push. Now I really have to do something and do something valuable with my time instead to maybe use this time specifically to take care of themselves. So I, I, I practically see this every day. People being like, I wasted my day. Um, I, I should have done something else today because I'm just home, right? It's not like I'm working or something. So uh, that's a problem, really. Is that something that you recognize, Stefani? Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely see what uh, Spiridon is saying. Um, however, I will say that we're talking about it more. We're talking about this issue more, like like here right now, and it's bringing awareness. And I think us talking about it and having this conversation is making us realize that it's okay to not be going crazy and uh, you know, like and having these high expectations. And it's okay to just you know spend a couple of hours on the couch and not doing anything, you know? And so I do see why everything is still very prevalent, but since we're talking about it, I think that it's, um, it's um, you know, we're lowering our, ex well, we're not lowering our expectations, but it's easier to live with and understand and manage these days. Yes. As we continue talking about it. Yes, because Michelle, I, we, we just had like a little pre-talk about this. And then we also uh, discovered that like, there's also a kind of a, how do you say stigma around uh, therapy, etc. So we, we it's now what you just mentioned, uh, Stephanie. It's discussed more and more and more, and that's why we, that's the reason why we do it is that we don't want to hide it, but we want to solve it all together and make the industry stronger. But there is still a kind of a stigma on therapy. So I'm not like I don't. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? How we could change that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there, there is a stigma around therapy. There is still a, a stigma around mental health and well-being full stop. Um, I think, as, as Stephanie and Spiridon have both said, this is, you know, we're building, we're raising our awareness around this. There are lots of barriers um, to, to having therapy. That it could be anything from a financial barrier to a social or cultural barrier or just, you know, an internal barrier about how you feel about therapy. You know, I think the thing to to that I always like to say about this is that we all have mental health. We're all on a, a spectrum of mental health somewhere. We'll all have good mental health at some points and we'll all have, you know, bad mental health at some points, depending on what is happening to us, our context what our challenges are and in the same way that you know if we if we have a physical injury and we might need to go to the hospital or a doctor it's you know our brains work in exactly the same way we we draw such kind of false distinctions in a way between our brain and our body, but <laughs> we can actually treat them in a fairly similar way. And so, you know, if we feel, if you feel like there is some support that you need, I hope, and um, I, you know, Spiridon and Stephanie might be able to speak to this a bit more in terms of um, this sector, um, certainly in the sector that I work in, those stigmas around therapy are gently and slowly beginning to, to break down a little bit now. And the more that we talk about it, the more that we normalize it, um, the, the easier it's going to be for people to, to think about accessing therapy and reaching out for therapy. What are your thoughts about this, Spiridon? Um, in Germany, for example, I often have, I mean, I, I see it and I have seen it how uh, in, in media, usually people would make, make, kind of make fun of the fact that there are so many analysts and therapists in America. And um, I, when, when, you, when you suck this information up as a very young person, obviously you're like, look at these people, right? Uh, they, they are all crazy. But when you grow older and realize that uh, it's actually your country that is uh, not very uh, developed in that sense and really has to catch up, then um, 
then then of course the perspective uh, not only changes but it's actually quite frightening to see how people are looking to um, to get help and they just can't get it because the demand is higher and there are no therapists especially now in this pandemic where people um, are moving to uh, apps like BetterHelp and and similar things because the availability is just so extremely low. Other countries are even in a in a worse um, situation. I talk with friends from uh, South America um, who have told me the exact same because um, they told me in their family or in their uh, city it's usually something like a, in their community it's more like a, a suck it up mentality and uh, don't uh, just just keep working. You could have it worse. Other people have it worse, which is of course very sabotaging in that sense. Um, I, I hope that changes. Uh, I think that in this industry, and especially not only in the industry, but in the community itself, um, there is a lot of progress um, because people are, I think we are like creative people talk more with each, with each other, right? Like we are exchanging with each other. We have um, maybe more to say and like, like for example, um, I only went to therapy when I when I went to one of the panels I organized, and 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 Max Berman said something that I really could relate to, right? And um, this is the thing where I'm I'm very much aware because of my personal experience that if people just keep talking about it and normalize it through that, that the stigma will fade away eventually. That's what I. It's good that the stigma is fading away and that it's more discussed. Even better is preventing and protect, protecting each other, right? So that you will not become in that position. Stephanie, what do you think, what's the most important thing we should prevent ourselves or protect ourselves for? Hmm. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I can explain it. It's, it's like um, we are specifically talking about like the creative industry, which is highly competitive. So you are yeah. constantly reflect your work with somebody else. You're constantly comparing your work on social media channels because it's so competitive. You think you should become the best or whatever. So there's a really high level of expectation. What do you think uh, should work uh, to prevent yourself for that kind of feelings that like this, uh, that you not, uh, how do you say, can cope with that kind of pressure? Yeah, I think that could depend on uh, different individuals and they have different ways of coping about it. For me, the way I deal with high expectations is I try to bring back to myself what I want to accomplish and what my passions are or what my goals are and what stories I also want to tell. What do I want to accomplish in my life? And then work towards that and then stop maybe comparing myself with others, see their path as going their way and then also accepting the path that I want to go and going in that direction that I don't need to be doing what everybody else is doing. Um, I have my own path and that's what I want to do. And that is maybe one suggestion that I can offer other artists to consider and to look into as an option into how to coping with, you know, and with stress and how other artists are doing and just think about themselves and what they want to do. All right. Yeah, but, but Michelle, if you, uh, uh, if you take such kind of decision, I go my own pathway, that's also quite well com connected to creative confidence in that sense, right? So how can we stimulate that kind of creative confidence? Because, yeah, that, that's, that's an issue, especially by people that are just starting off. They don't have like, quite that much of uh, references for themselves. Yeah, so um, it's, it, it can be very, very difficult to go your own pathway. That is, that's for sure. Um, confidence, um, if we were to think about it from a psychological perspective, um, confidence is related to the actions that we take. So if people are looking to, um, to stimulate creative confidence in a way that is sustainable, so in a way that's not going to really, really stress you out, right? Um, you want to, they want to, you want to be thinking about actions. What kind of actions can you take? And it's kind of alluding to what Stephanie was talking about because she was talking about her goals. So um, a really good way to start building creative confidence is to look at the goals that you have 
right, to, to break the goals that you have down into really small steps, right? The goal has to stimulate you. It has to be a, a bit of a stretch goal, but something that you um, that you feel capable of achieving in the long term, right? So choose a goal that excites you, right, that, that feels meaningful to you in some way, and then break it down into small actions right and small steps because as you go through those small actions and those small steps you're going to be climbing towards your goal and you're going to be building up your sense of agency right you're going to build up your sense of self-efficacy and this becomes a, a virtual kind of upward cycle so i think that the the key to it is like stephanie said like get get your goal but don't expect that you're going to be standing in one place looking at a goal <laughs> that's maybe a year even, maybe longer, right, down the road, thinking, why am I not there now? I'm really upset or I'm frustrated or I'm disappointed with myself because I'm not there now. When really where you need to be is exactly where you are, <laughs> looking at the next step. Just what is the next step that I need to take? And then as you move towards and you achieve those next steps, that's how that's how you're going to work sustainably. And that's how you're going to start building up your creative confidence. Yeah, so it's actually growth because that's also a problem, I think, <laughs> with a lot of people nowadays. It's the instant success. They, they, they really want not to give themselves the time to develop them in a sustainable way or to allow themselves to grow in the way they need to grow. Uh, they, they have this sense of fear of missing out, this, this speedy career, because now you can do everything, and maybe in 10 years everything looks different than you missed your, uh, your goal that you were just defining. Is that mm -hmm. something that you recognize, Stephanie? That instant success? Yeah. I don't know anybody who has instant success. Uh, maybe there's some, uh, there's some, maybe a small percentage of lucky ones out there, but for the most of us, we start small and we grow and uh, eventually, hopefully we'll get to a place where we want to be or not. Maybe we just want to continue growing. Um, for example, I just started running and uh, I was, I thought I was going to get to 5k in my first run. No, uh, I failed miserably. So I downloaded the uh, the couch to 5k app and uh, I'm doing one minute running one minute walking and now I'm doing two minutes running and slowly building upon that and I'm improving and doing better so that's the same thing with art you know you don't expect to be a master on as soon as you pick up a pencil it's uh, you're gonna keep on working and practicing and exploring and discovering yourself Growth and this path is actually a really can be really enjoyable if you look at it this way as a as a you know it's not a negative thing. Don't maybe why would what happens when you reach the top? What happens? You get bored, you know. Enjoy the enjoy the growth process. Yeah. Hey, um, but there is like this this thing that little devil on your shoulder, which is called the fear of failure. Um, uh, it's true, and what I hear is really uh, makes sense and really good sense. But when I listen to students and I talk to students, they are already sometimes afraid to send a mail to get in touch with somebody, uh, to make that little, really small step so that you have your, your, there's a portfolio review session, but you don't dare to show your portfolio because you can't handle the feedback. Um, or, or don't know how to handle or interpret the feedback, and then you choose not to do it. Uh, so that little steps, even though they're really small, um, they are sometimes really a problem. Is that something that you recognize, especially in the creative industry or in the field of arts, that it feels personally, and the fail of the fear of failure is even bigger? I think that that if you if you look at um, Little baggins with um, taking the first step because every journey starts with the first step. Um, you're you have to just I don't know like like repeat this like a mantra, right? Um, I think that all these people that are afraid to fail should, and that's my 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 personal uh, um, idea of how I tackled my uh, imposter syndrome, uh, which is imposter syndrome is really hard when you when it comes easy to you to learn new things. So you have the feeling you didn't work as hard as other people, and that makes you think that you, um, you you don't deserve to be where others are. 
And if you look into Stoicism and maybe discover Seneca or other people who are just talking about the the situation right now, right? Like like how to to accept how things happened. And you maybe um, just make a list about your achievements, as small as they are. You will see that you have done things, and not just the people you follow on social media. It might not be the stuff that you see there. And it, it seems to be a lot, right? Like when you go on Instagram or Facebook and people have like this new life event post and they're like, I have a job there. I have a job there. I just started doing this and blah. It, it gets a lot, right? But if you look at the single person doing this, they don't do it a lot. You just see a lot of people doing this all the time. And if you apply this to yourself and you see like, okay, I, I did baby steps, right? I, I did something. And maybe you will have the courage to move on in the future much easier and see that every chance not taken is just missed, right? Like you, you just have to. I mean, I'm saying I, you just have to. It's not that easy. I, I realize that myself. But if you if you, if you don't do this at all, then you will never know if you could have done it, right? If if it if it could have worked out the way that you want to. Um, look into stoicism. I, I for me, it has made a big big change. I it changed my life. <laughs> Yeah, the reason why I, I want to discuss it, uh, and that's from my own experience, that within art, it's sometimes, and what I already just mentioned, it feels so personal, and it should not be personal. It should be a learning moment for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're putting your soul on a table and people are going to judge your soul if you are like uh, a, a good person or that you work hard, etc. But they look at your work and they want to help you grow and learn something from their feedback. Uh, so that you don't always see your work as, as something personal, but actually a way to communicate. And you just check if your work communicates in the way you thought of. Because that's a lot, in a lot of ways, it's from students' perspective, there are a lot of assumptions in your work. And you have to check with your audience or with your peers or with your future client if that what you think works actually works. So if you just see it as a test instead of a certain kind of personal judgment, it, it becomes also a little bit more easier. Uh, I compare it with like riding skates. It's ice skating. I'm really bad in ice skating, so honestly, and even though I'm Dutch. Um, so, uh, but when you go ice skating or skiing in the mountains, you allow yourself to fall a lot because that's part of the learning process of ice skating. You already know that you will have blue buttons, bo blue bottoms, and that you actually look foolish in a ski class in Austria, right? But you, you already accept that because that's part of the process. But that's not that much accepted in the creative industry or at art academies, that you actually can compare that with the same kind of learning process. And that's why I like it so much what you're just suggesting. It's that little chain of success. I'm a big, that's what I, I did also did some research, it's the chain of success. First, you try to, st to stand up on a skate. You're not riding at all, but you just try to stand mm. and just do nothing. You're not going to do a pirouette or anything. You just try to not fall. That's the first step. And then you make a little movement, et cetera, et cetera. So that, and then the things can, can, can work out. And that's like that little successes and what you're also referring for, that little steps that are so important to allow yourself to grow in that mm. position you want to see yourself uh, uh, is, is that something that you, that you acknowledge? Is that, is that, am I right or am I wrong? Is that, uh, what do you think, uh, Stephanie? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, it's always about the small steps and, uh, you know, and going from there. And then once you, you know, you learn something, you'll just improve continuously uh, as long as you want to. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think yeah, also I that think, we, yeah. sh we should support each other in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I always make myself available to all artists in the community. Sometimes I, I go to schools, for example, now virtually, and I tell them if you want, you know, learn how to use ArtStation or if you need some help, I'm always here for you. And uh, most people don't reply to these, but I occasionally do get one or two students that do reach out. And uh, I always admire their courage because it, it's not obvious to, you know, to say, OK, yes, I will uh, reach out to Stephanie and see what she has to say or if she can give me some tips. But um, I might not always have the answers, but I'm always there to help. I have. I see that I, uh, that there's like some questions in the chat. I will try to look. Uh, is there a question? Yes. Um, Lexi is asking. I want to ask about feeling imposter syndrome. 
but it's not necessarily imposter syndrome. For a specific example, when you switch, sorry, when you switch industry drastically and your brain is constantly second guessing your decision. Oh, that's not a question, right? Yeah, but she tries to find out like like um, what to do against that. There's another question here: is um, is art school crucial to an artistic growth? So is it like always? Uh, that's that's a question. Who wants to answer that? Spirit on. Not me. Not you. <laughs> Stephanie, is it's do you like do you think art art station <laughs> has also learning uh, environments? Do you think art uh, schools are necessary for for an artistic growth? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that schools specifically are. Um, they could definitely help. Uh, I went to art school and uh, it didn't help me with my artistic growth at all. I didn't end up being a coming an artist. So I don't know what that says, but, but it's, you know, every school is different. Some are better, some are not as good. You really have to identify which school will be the best for, you know, yourself. Sometimes you just have to try a class and then you'll, you'll know. Um, but no, for artistic growth, like a, the school as an institution, uh, no, you could also, um, you know, learn different ways through online learning. Um, so being a lot of artists are self-taught in our industry. Um, for me, art school was always about connecting and meeting other artists. Um, that's what art school was about. Um, but it wasn't, it didn't impact my artistic growth. No. And I think everybody has a unique pathway, right? So some things sure. that fits for you, something it's online. Uh, maybe you can work it out with your friends. Everybody has their own way to, to do it. That would be my uh, suggestion. And, and I work in an art academy, so uh, uh, in that sense. Um, um, school, some students strive in, in, in schools and some others don't. Uh, there's no one, I don't believe there's one size fits all. No. Um, I also have here like quite a personal question from Ralph. Uh, I feel like this subject mostly is aimed to youngsters. Now I'm about six months away becoming 40, and the pile of failures I have on my back is getting heavy. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 can you say something about that, Michelle? Maybe like, it, we're not focusing only on youngsters, Ralph, so that just make it clear. But I can imagine that when, when it takes a long time, how can you deal with it uh, and it becomes an even more heavier task for yourself? Yeah, I think um, that's a really, really good, um, uh, really, really good question, Ralph. Um, so um, if you feel like you've clocked up quite a few failures, um, that can that can feel like a really, really difficult thing. And um, so there's a couple of things that I would um, I think I would ask you to, to pay attention to. The first thing would would be your mindset. And we're coming back to that idea of, of failure again why why are we treating these things as failures could we could we take a growth mindset around things that are failures what did you learn from the things that you failed at what are your reflections you know to, to, to kind of have that quality of um, self-inquiry um, and reflective practice around the things that you are considering to be failures nearly always you will have learned amazing things around your failures. I think it's important to say that from the brain perspective, um, you know, the, one of the ways that the, the brain is creative is by synthesizing things, right? So experimentation, learning from mistakes, learning from your experience, learning from other people's experiences, learning from the past. Um, you know, creativity doesn't happen in a mental vacuum, right? So everything that you've done, in a sense, is a contribution to your to your creative brain. Um, but we tend to see the, the, the framework of failure as something that we should feel very disappointed about, that we might feel a bit of shame around, we might feel frustration, sadness, all of the big and, and negative and, and, emotions. And Michelle, it's also that it's physical, right? You told me that the brain is always focusing on the negativity, right? Yeah. Yeah, such a good point, <laughs> Leon. We are uh, one of the big, one of the great neuroscientific discoveries, the negativity bias in the brain. Your, your brain, Ralph, is hardwired to negativity. It was our survival mechanism. It's how we got as humans to the top of the food chain by paying great attention to the negative things around us. 
what it means in the 21st century, we still have this negativity bias in our brain. And so it means that we pay tons of attention to the things that we think that we've done wrong. So we really have to resist the negativity bias in the brain, have a lot of compassion for it. Okay, we're, we're, we're working with a with a with a brain that, um, you know, the most powerful part of our brain is, you know, still like 200 200,000 years ago living in the past. So in the 21st century, um, you know, we, we want to kind of resist that negativity bias a little bit. So growth mindset, what did you, what have you learned? Also, where have you succeeded? I can guarantee you, I'm sure, Ralph, that you haven't j just failed throughout your career. There will have been places where you have succeeded. And so, you know, work, work against that negativity bias by listing out all of the things that you've succeeded at, all of your learnings from the things that you think that you failed at, and start to kind of reframe the, the failures into amazing growth and learning opportunities, amazing things that your, that your brain is going to synthesize and draw on, and then also think about all of the things that you have done that have been successful, because I can guarantee you that there, that there are going to be things that you have succeeded at. Yes. And there's also um, an issue, and that's, um, maybe it's not totally scientific, uh, but maybe help me then if I'm, co I'm not correct, uh, Michelle. But if you can define personalities, we are talking sometimes, at least at, at, at educational courses that I, I'm sometimes following, about like introversy, versus extroversy. And within the field of a lot of designers, makers, it tends to be like working with a lot of introvert uh, people. Um, uh, maybe also a question for you, Stephanie, uh, because ArtStation is portfolio, uh, is, uh, is different ways of actually expressing yourself instead of like, I, I don't know if I'm correctly English, but it's like stone cold acquisition. So there are like sometimes people that are not like um, how do you say the the first one in the ra in the role. Uh, um, they have different ways to find the contacts and the networks they need because everybody is afraid of going to a network event, right? And drinking coffee with strange people. Uh, at least I'm still f have nightmares on my first ones in a soccer stadium with all those business people, and I was just a young designer trying to to get a network. So that's frightening. Um, but I think like platforms like you help, right? So what, what would be a good advice for people to present themselves in the best way, uh, like, on, like an art station? What are like some, can you give us some guidance or if there are like uh, bypasses to work around that difficult situation? Oof, I don't know if there is. Um, on our station, obviously, anybody can just post. Um, I do want to say that uh, if, you go on our station and you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough to post here. Um, don't please don't think that we get over like 50,000 uploads per week of artwork. And believe me, they're all different. They're all on different levels. Um, so I know it could be a bit frightening, but just don't be afraid. Just go ahead and post. Then the next step is what you could do is Follow artists that you think, you know, you like and you want to learn more about and um, and just follow and maybe introduce yourself, write a blog post, say, hello, I exist. Um, I know sometimes it can be very intimidating. I know I'm an introvert, so maybe I'm more of an ambivert. Yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's the middle, uh, the middle class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I'm yeah. in the middle there. Yeah, yeah, and, me too. Uh, yeah, and it takes a lot of effort, but you know, at one point you're like, hey, if I, if that's where I want to go, and if this is where I want to be, then I gotta take that first step. Um, I always also tell, I like the quote from Gandhi: "Be the change you want to see in the world." You know, so, you know, if you see something and you want to change it, you want to be part of, and you want to make something with it, then you know, you just have to dive in a little bit. Yeah, and uh, what I, I learned about it as well is that <coughs> from that class that I got about like introversy and, and uh, extroversy, it's that 
make, plan yourself or not prepare yourself for the situation. So don't let yourself overwhelmed by the situation because that can be too much stimulation. It can be like too much emotion at the same time. But prepare yourself quite thoroughly, uh, which means that um, do some research on how to present your portfolio in the best way. If you feel a little bit difficult when going to a network, make sure you bring friends with you. Make sure that you have like your, your portfolio in the best possible way. Think about like the little steps you want to make. So what's your goal for going through that network event, right? And also prepare yourself already that maybe you take nothing from that network event back home. So that you actually can have the right expectations is that, is, that, is that correct, what I wanted to say? And also lower down that expectation, so make that steps, which we all say, and I think that's a little bit the red line, uh, the baby steps, allow yourself those baby steps, but also think about what kind of steps you want to make that helps you in sometimes difficult situations like extroversy, introversy, dilemmas. Am I right, Michelle? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't study for it, I have to be honest, but... I think you're completely right. You know, prime yourself to succeed, right? So give yourself the, the best possible chance. If you know that you're fairly introverted and that's a difficult um, networking, I mean, who, honestly, who does like networking? But um, if, you, if you're really somebody who struggles with it, can absolutely prime yourself. Make sure that your portfolio is is ready, um, you know, take some friends with you. That's a great idea. Nobody wants to, you know, be hanging out on their own <laughs> at the bar, right? Um, I, I really kind of do a bit of a reframe around networking because, again, I just think it's such, it's such high pressure. And, you know, that idea that you're going to go in there and pitch and do the hard sell of the brand, you, um, I think it's I think it's really really tough, especially especially for young people, but also for anybody who is a bit more introverted. Uh, you know, I think, and you said something interesting. Uh, you know, Leon, you said you know don't don't think too much about what you're going to take away. And I think you know sometimes that's the the key is what are you going to take away? And what I encourage people to think about in terms of networking is you you are going there to develop long-term, trusting, warm, meaningful relationships with other people, right? So you're going there to share with other people, not necessarily to go in and do some kind of hideous hard sell of yourself and your work, right? You're going to, to, to work out who are the people that I connect most with here, who's my tribe here. And, and ideally, you know, you, you want to have long, long relationships with these people, right? Because you want to, to, to work with them over a long, thriving career. So um, to, to kind of reframe it a little bit from that kind of hard sell um, to thinking about how do I share myself? What can, what can I offer this person rather than what am I going to get from this person? Um, and I think it's, it's less pressure for introverted people. And actually, you know, that kind of shift in mindset might even play into introversion skills then, which, you know, tend to be things like listening carefully to other people, paying attention to other people, listening for interesting details and, you know, asking really well considered questions. These are the building blocks of, of developing really, really good long-term relationships with people. That's what I think networking should be about. All right. I'm going to check to the chat because we're almost finished. We have uh, just a few minutes left, like not even three. So I have to check. Is there from the, uh, the chat and from our audience, is there like an important question you still want to ask or is there a subject you still need an answer on? Uh, because... Yeah, we, feel, we all feel uh, responsible. We really want to help you out and give you all the information you need in this moment. Uh, no well, questions? I want to expand upon uh, what Michelle said. Um, as an introvert mm -hmm. and somebody who did study sales, because I do have to do some sales work at our station because I do sell advertising, uh, hard selling is the worst thing you can do. That's the best way you're going to turn off somebody from 
you know, developing a, a meaningful contact, they will just run away the other, they'll, they'll just, oh my God, you're selling to me, please, I want to go away, right, and run away. Um, what you want to do, though, is, and as an introvert um, who doesn't like to talk very much, I like to listen and use that skill to really listen. Maybe just say, hello, how are you? Um, you know, uh, you know, just ask them a little bit about themselves and let others people talk, especially if you meet an extrovert, let them talk all they want and you can just listen and absorb all the information that they give you. And it's for me personally, I love when other people talk. Okay. Now I'm talking a lot, but in most cases, <laughs> no, 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 cool. I like to be quiet. And I just like to listen and absorb and hear what people are telling me. And then I'll go back into my own little bubble and see what I can do to, you know, answer and help them out uh, in the future. So definitely, if you are a good listener, that's an amazing skill to have. Well, uh, we are there in this last minute and I, I, I want to wrap this up. Um, because I want to say um, that this 24 hours, our goal was to inspire you. So, and maybe we showed you the best of the best, uh, we showed you beautiful work, uh, but please see it as an inspiration and don't compare yourself with that. But allow yourself to grow uh, in the skill sets you want to grow and in the position you want to grow. So please follow your own path and use this day as, a, as an energy, as a meetup moment uh, uh, with like-minded people, uh, but please don't use it to compare yourself in a bad manner. Uh, I, I hope these kind of events uh, and also this meetup with people from all over the world with all their own uh, difficulties that we share each other's knowledge in these kind of events, like what Stephanie says, listen to each other and please create a safe environment in these kind of events where we allow each other to learn, to grow and to share knowledge and to encourage each other to go on with the thing that we like so much, which is like making a great visual uh, and, and making a great creative visual storytelling projects. I hope I wrapped this up correctly. Uh, it's red, so I'm on zero, 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 zero. So I hope I timed it well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Spiridon, Stephanie and Michelle, for sharing your knowledge and, uh, and, and bringing all your insights in this panel discussion. I truly hope the audience had some insights. So thank you so much for your time and being part of, with us in this adventure.